Hey, book friends, it's Sarah from the GSMC Book Review Podcast. As the weather gets chillier, maybe you're thinking of getting a new comforter or a new quilt to wrap up in on cold autumn and coming winter days to snuggle under and read a book with. Well, I have got just the deal for you. If you are looking for new bedding for a down alternative reversible comforter for a really fun quilt, Anything bedding with classic colors, you should go to linensandhutch.com. Right now, if you use the promo code GSMCBOOK, when you check out, you will receive 70% off their entire website, as well as free shipping. Yes, you heard me right, 70% off. They have cut out the middle person. They work directly with designers and manufacturers, which means they can pass the savings directly on to you. So if you're looking for new bedding, especially the cozy quilt or blankie to wrap up in while you read a good book, go to linensandhutch.com and use the promo code GSMCBOOK during checkout. You will receive 70% off and free shipping on their entire website. Golden State Media Concepts bring you Book Review Podcast, a haven for bookworms of all ages and the widest genres from mystery to memoirs, romance to comedy, fantasy to sci-fi. If you love to read, this is the podcast for you. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast. Hello and welcome to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I am your host, Sarah, and happy to be with you as I continue to work on catching up on interviews and posting them, because I have amazing authors that talk to me on this podcast, and I want to share them with you, and so I am working very hard to get back on track after a crazy couple of months. If you listened to the last episode, then you know today I am speaking with author Edward Willett. This is his second appearance on the podcast to talk about his World Shapers series. The first time he was here, we talked about the first two books, and now book three is out. If you are interested in listening to that other episode before you listen to this one, if you haven't heard it already, that is episode 193. Um, Again, interview with Edward Willett. That was almost exactly a year ago. It was November 1st last year. So really fun to have Edward back on the podcast. Let me go ahead and read you the description of The Moonlit World, which is book three of the World Shapers series. Fresh from their adventures in a world inspired by Jules Verne, Shauna Keyes and Carl Yatzer find themselves in a world that mirrors much darker tales. Beneath a full moon that hangs motionless in the sky, they're forced to flee terrifying vampiric creatures, only to run straight into a pack of werewolves. As the lycanthropes and undead battle, Carl is spirited away to the castle of the Vampire Queen. Meanwhile, Shauna finds short-lived refuge in a fortified village, where she learns that something has gone horribly wrong with the world in which she finds herself. Once, Werewolves, vampires, and humans lived there harmoniously. Now every group is set against every other, and entire villages are being mysteriously emptied of people. Somehow, Carl and Shauna must reunite, discover the mysteries of the shaping of this strange world, and escape for and escape it for the next, without being sucked dry, devoured, or worst of all, turned into creatures of the night themselves. Beneath the frozen gibbous moon, allies, enemies, surprises, adventures, and unsettling revelations await. Again, that is the description of The Moonlit World by Edward Willett. It is the third in his World Shapers series. Now, if you are unfamiliar with this series, Edward's going to talk about it here in a few minutes, but um, there are two, the two characters that are mentioned, Shauna Keys and Carl Yatzer, are traveling 
through different worlds on a quest and each world is shaped by a different shaper. So they can take on, they may look a lot like our earth or they may look very, very different. Uh, as it's said in the description, the last world they were on was shaped by um, a shaper who was a fan, a, a fan of Jules Verne. And so there's a lot of steampunk and there was a lot of different uh, aspects of Jules Verne in that. And here obviously we have vampires and werewolves, but the shapers, the shaper who makes each world can uh, put their own spin on things. So they may have traditional vampire and werewolf lore, or they may not. So there are so many possibilities in these stories that Edward writes because they're based in some things that we might be familiar with in terms of literature or popular culture or um, things like that. But they can take a different direction because the shaper can create whatever he or she wants in each world. Speaking of pop culture, these books are littered with references to pop culture. They um, remind me that I am a bit of a nerd because I get most of them. Uh, the ones that I don't get, I'm like, well, okay, I'm not as big of a nerd as I thought I might be. <laughs> or maybe I'm not as big of a nerd as Edward. Sorry, Edward, I mean that as a compliment. Um, but so many pop culture references and they tend to make me laugh out loud really um you know that I laugh out loud a lot when I'm reading books much to my husband's dismay <laughs> so let's go ahead and turn now to the interview with Edward Willett again the series is World Shapers this is book three and it's called The Moonlit World hi Edward welcome back to the podcast thanks so much for having me I am excited to have you back. Um, as I was saying before we started recording, it has been almost exactly a year since you were on the podcast last, so that is exciting. We're here to talk about your new book in your World Shapers series. That one's called The Moonlit World. But before we get to that book um, and the series, if you could start, just for people who might not have heard the previous interview, um, if you could tell us a little bit about yourself, that would be wonderful. Sure. Well, I am the my. I automatically click into my almost memorized bio at this point. <laughs> I'm the award-winning author of more than uh, 60 uh, books of science fiction, fantasy, and nonfiction for readers of all ages. Um, my nonfiction has run. You know, I'm a free, full-time freelance writer and have been since 1993. So. Uh, nonfiction is basically anything anybody will say need to write. I've done a lot of children's biographies and science books for educational publishers, genetics demystified from McGraw Hill, that kind of thing, local history. But on the fiction side, I have I've lost track, but it's around 20 novels. Um, <clears throat> with um, my major publisher is Daw Books, uh, one of the major science fiction fantasy publishers in New York, and uh, yeah, I've. The current one, The Moonlit World, is my 11th for them, I believe. Or is it my 12th? <laughs> I'm terrible at this. Um, and I live in uh, Regina. <laughs> I do. I live in uh, Regina, Saskatchewan, Canada. I'm also a professional actor and singer. I've done a fair amount of stage work over the years. Married to a uh, past president of the Association of Professional Engineers and the Geoscientists of Saskatchewan and have a a university age daughter and a black Siberian cat named Shadowpaw. I think that covers it. <laughs> I think so. And and Shadowpaw actually uh, has has his her I'm not sure own, own social media presence. Uh, you know a little bit. Um, well, he does a bit, when... and he's also uh, like I have a publishing company too, a little publishing company I started called Shadowpaw Press, which is named after him. Um, he Aww. has a publishing history. He was actually um, my publisher. Uh, Daw Books has. Uh, Betsy Wolheim and Sheila Gilbert are the editors and the publishers. They they own the company. And Betsy owns his uncle, Roscoe, and knew a Siberian breeder in Virginia, and or West Virginia. And uh, she found us this kitten. And because my wife's allergic, but some people are able to live with Siberian cats, even though they're allergic. So we got this kitten. I went down to New York, and they they my publisher drove down to uh, West Virginia. I drove down to Baltimore picked up the cat, drove him up to New York. I went down, I flew down to New Jersey, stayed with my my editor, Sheila Gilbert in New Jersey, met the cat, did all the New York stuff, you know, met my agent and all that stuff, and then uh, flew back with the cat. So he's he's got a, a pretty substantial publishing history himself. <laughs> 
he he does. Does he get appropriate um, compensation for that? <clears throat> well, his picture's on every book that Shadowpaw Press publishes. He's my logo, so I think that. <laughs> Aw. <laughs> otherwise, he doesn't seem to care much, but. <laughs> right, right. As long as there's food. Yeah. <laughs> food and <Yes>. laughs. Well, um, we could talk about the cat, but we should probably talk about the book. <laughs> so <laughs> the series is, um, it's your World Shapers series. This is the third book. Can you give um, an overview of the series itself? Sure. World Shapers, the premise of World Shapers is that there is this interdimensional, I don't know, know, use whatever word you want, this labyrinth of shaped worlds, um, and that people from our world, there are certain people from our world who have the ability, if they go into this labyrinth, they can take a blank space, basically, and turn it into a world of their imagination. It's about a bit like authors living inside the books that they've uh, created. They all come from our world originally, and they all went to this uh, school run by a mysterious woman named Agrair who we find out in the first book is actually uh, an alien. <laughs> and uh, we don't really know why she's, uh, it's not established exactly why she's putting people into the labyrinth to shape worlds, but she does. <clears throat> so in the first book, we meet my main character, who is uh, Shauna Keys, and she doesn't know that she's the shaper of the world she's living in. She's forgotten all about the first world and the school and agrarian and all of that. She just thinks she lives in the world, and she has a pretty nice life going. She's got a nice boyfriend, and she's uh, about to open a pottery studio. She's a potter. And then there's this terrible attack, and her best friend is killed in what appears to be a terrorist attack. And the leader of this attack uh, touches Shauna and then points a gun at her is going to kill her. And she, she thinks, she says, this can't be happening. This isn't happening. And just like that, it isn't happening. Not only that, but it never did happen. It's like three hours earlier, none of that ever happened. She's the only one that remembers it. She's also the only one who remembers her best friend, who's now vanished from the world, and nobody even uh, remembers her having existed. So this sets off alarm bells. <laughs> and then uh, this mysterious stranger, Carl Yatzer, who she's seen previously, shows up and kind of explains that, that she's the shaper of this world. He thinks she's shown the power that, through resetting time, that she has the power to if she comes with him to other worlds within the labyrinth, she can gather the knowledge of the making of these worlds and get all of that to Agrair, who's hiding out somewhere else in the labyrinth. Because Agrair was attacked, the school was attacked, and there's this uh, adversary who's trying to move from world to world, working his way toward Agrair, and wants to destroy all the labyrinth, taking over the worlds one at a time and eventually destroying the labyrinth and all the, all the worlds, all the shapers, and all the billions of people who live in these worlds. So that's the basic premise. And in the first book, uh, Carl and Shauna chase across, are chased across uh, her version of our world, which is very much like our world with a few differences, like lacrosse is the big professional sport and the Da Vinci Code was a musical on Broadway, little things like that. <laughs> and then in the <laughs> spoiler, she does, <laughs> that's one of my favorite jokes, actually. Yeah. In there. <laughs> Hugh Jackman did his best, but he just couldn't save it. Um, and then, then the second one, uh, The Master of the World, which came out last year, which is probably what we talked about in the last interview, um, she finds her way into a world that was shaped by somebody who really loves uh, Jules Verne. So it's all full of uh, weird airships and submarines and floating islands and strange weapons and all that good, solid, steampunky stuff from Jules Verne's novels. And then the third one, the one that just came out, The Moonlit World, is best summed up by the phrase that kept running through my head when I was writing it, which was, Werewolves and vampires and peasants. Oh, my. Because <laughs> it's a world where the moon always shines. The full moon hangs in the sky. It doesn't move constantly. And um, it's a world inhabited by werewolves and vampires and peasants. And uh, they have to find the shaper of this world. And, and, you know, without getting turned into an undead creature of the night or a, a lycanthrope. So those are the challenges they face in this book. <laughs> Okay, so now that you've got a bit of um, an idea of what's going on in this World Shapers series, I was going to say World Shapers World, but there's more than one world. So the World Shapers series, let's go ahead and take our first break of the podcast. And when we come back, more with Edward Willett. So stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I will be right back. 
Golden State Media Concepts bring you the Bible Study Podcast. Reflect and journey the Bible as together we study God's Word and be inspired. Bible study made fun and informative for all ages. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Bible Study Podcast. GSMC Book Review Podcast. I am speaking today with author Edward Willett about his third book in the Moon, excuse me, in the World Shapers series. This one is called The Moonlit World. He just gave an overview of the series and um, as I'm about to say, I am always impressed when people can describe books like this coherently and um, stay tuned to find out why that impresses me. You did a very good job of explaining the series as a whole. Um, I love I love listening to and also trying to explain um, science fiction or fantasy books because they can they they always sound so crazy when you when you just try to describe them briefly. They always make perfect sense when you read them, but when you first try to describe it, it's like wait, what? Is a what? <laughs> and if you're the author, you have to think, what do I put in? What do I leave out? You know, because obviously I right. I have all the details and it's easy to get bogged down and start saying, well, well, that's not quite right. It's really more like this. And, you know, this, but it's sort of like that. And I, I try, I've tried to boil it down pretty good. <laughs> yes. Yes. So this one is, um, you said the, the phrase vampires and werewolves and peasants, maybe I got that mixed up, oh my, but you know, those three things, oh my, running through your head. Uh, was that your initial inspiration or did that just start running through your head after you started writing? Way back when I first came up with the concept for this this series, uh, I always wanted to do a kind of a gothic world with werewolves and vampires and that sort of thing. And so this one has been in the back of my head right from before I even started writing the series back back when the series site concept was completely different because uh, the original concept, she's always, a, Shauna's always been a potter, but she wasn't named Shauna. And uh, instead of living in a world, she lived in like this long valley and in a, like a pleasant little village. And it was much more of a fantasy setting and all these different worlds opened out through caves in the side of this valley. That was the original concept. And it's changed considerably since then. But I always knew that I was going to do a werewolf vampire uh, world um, pretty early on. I just love werewolves and vampires. That was oh, my yeah, chance to write about know, them. <laughs> right, exactly. They're, you know, and they've they've definitely been very popular in in books and movies lately um for a while now. What about Shauna do you think is going to resonate with readers if, you know, if they first what what will resonate with readers who maybe haven't started the series and then uh, following up how do you think she continues to resonate with readers as they travel through the series with her i hope that people find shauna a pleasant companion she you know werewolves vampires all this stuff could sound a little grim and there's certainly lots of you know grim and and uh, terrifying things that happen over the in the books because you know they're adventure stories but uh, shauna is i hope funny <laughs> she's uh she has my sense of humor oddly enough and uh she she's because her world is only 10 years out of sync with ours like every her, she knows everything up until 10 years ago pop culture and so forth she makes star wars jokes and star trek jokes and she knows about buffy the vampire slayer and she you know she at least read some jules verne and so she's kind of plugged into the same source material that the shapers of all these worlds are plugged into and that gives me an opportunity to make jokes like, uh, and she's also a musical theater fan, so that gives me a chance to do my uh, my the Da Vinci Code, the musical joke. And there was a joke in Master of the World about one of the characters who kind of had a theatrical background in that within that world just couldn't believe that anything such as Cats, the musical, actually existed. <laughs> so I get to make all those kinds of jokes. And uh, I think that makes Shauna something, somebody that, will stick in people's heads if somebody's pleasant to spend time with. 
And I guess the other thing I hope is that Shauna is resourceful. She manages to get through the most tremendous situations and come out the other side and accomplish what she needs to accomplish uh, with a lot of self-doubt along the way and things like that. But uh, I I think she's a, a strong and interesting character, and I hope that's what resonates with people. Yeah, and I like her because, um, you know, she has forgotten that she is a shaper. So she is, in a lot of ways, I mean, she's not a normal human because she is a shaper, but in a lot of ways, she is a normal human because she is just trying to figure this out as she goes along. And, um, you know, she has to find the resources within herself. You know, she's not a superhero. She's not, um, she's not Buffy the Vampire Slayer. She's just kind of a regular person who is trying to figure out all these different worlds um and that's one thing that i really like about her yeah she in a way you know in 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 the first world she when she discovers she's the shaper she has some ability to literally shape the world around her and change people and things like that uh in the second book because she doesn't have any ability to shape a world until she finds the shaper and takes their their uh Hakma, it's called, which is a Hebrew word meaning wisdom, until she takes that knowledge of the shaping of the world. She's just a, she's just an ordinary person doing her best, trying to get to where she can make that happen. But until that happens, she has no special powers in whatever world she finds herself in. And I think that makes her interesting as well. I, I would agree. She is accompanied by Carl, who is introduced in the first book. Uh, they are... Um, together most of the time, but separated some of the time. So how is that um, relationship evolving as the series goes on? Well, when Carl first shows up, he's, she thinks of him as like her all-knowing guide. He's the only one that knows what's going on. She doesn't have a clue. As time goes along, uh, for most of the second book, Master of the World, Carl is stuck in her world, and she's on her own entirely. And uh, so by the time he shows up, she's navigated her way through this. There's still stuff she doesn't know that he knows it, that she starts to find out. Then in this third book, in the Moonlit World, she starts to get more ability herself. And so the big change in the Moonlit World, I think, is that instead of just being the, the uh, hang, not exactly the hanger-on, but, you know, kind of uh, the, she has to follow where, where he leads, she actually becomes the leader and the, the powerful force that decides where they go next by the end of this book. And so that's kind of their changing relationship. There's no romantic relationship between these two at all. He's quite a bit older than she is. And uh, he is in love. Uh, he's only ever been in love with one woman, and he's quite faithful to that memory. So there's no uh, there's no romantic relationship between them at all, um, which I think is also kind of nice in a, in a book where you have a male and a female character, and that's just not part of their... Uh, it's a bit like... Bit like the doctor, you know. Sometimes his companions get uh, kind of fall in love with him, but he's that's never going to happen. <laughs> the other right. the other direction. Close we ever got was with Rose, I guess. But yeah, that, so that I think that's kind of interesting. But that that relationship is evolving, and Carl and her goals are not necessarily always going to be the same. Uh, and uh, we get a little hint of that in the in the Moonlit World that uh, there's something she does toward the end of the book that kind of alarms him as to what how she's developing. So. There's some interesting, th- I hope, interesting things going on there. Right. Well, and they come at it from different perspectives because he has been given this quest, I guess you, you could call it a quest, but um, by Agrair, and so he has a specific goal in mind, and he has his reasons for wanting to complete this journey and, you know, make sure that the worlds are restored, whereas Shauna was kind of thrown into it as being a powerful shaper, and so they definitely come at it from different perspectives. Yeah, and we there are, there's different goals for sure. And Carl and she and Shauna knows this that Carl has said, well, you know, if anything happens to you, that would be terrible. But I'll just have to find another shaper who can do it. <laughs> so uh, that, that yeah. puts a little uh, tension there too. Yeah, yeah, Carl is a viewpoint character. That's one of the interesting things about writing the book is that it's mostly in first person from Shauna's viewpoint, but both mm-hmm. the adversary and Carl get their own occasionally there's only the adversary hardly appears in this book but carl's sections then are written in third person and hers are written in first person and i i find that interesting um to do as a writer and i hope it's interesting for readers yeah it definitely gives you um a a bit of a different perspective and you get to see 
obviously when Carl's separated from Shauna, then you, you see what he's doing. But um, even when they're together, then you see things from his perspective, which is nice. Um, you have mentioned, you know, you've mentioned the doctor. I mentioned, uh, we've mentioned Buffy, Star Trek, Star Wars. The, the books are littered with pop culture references, <laughs> which is fun. Is that how your brain works? You said Shauna has your sense of humor, but is that just the way your brain is going all the time? <laughs> or do you kind of work at putting that into the book? Pretty much. I don't have to work very hard at that at all. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, it's, when When a joke occurs to me, or a pop culture reference occurs to me, uh, Shauna knows it. And, you know, I, I freely admit that for her supposed age, she's uh, 27 and when the first book starts, uh, some of her references are perhaps a little older. But on the other hand, in this modern age, I mean, my daughter, who's 19, gets, you know, everything is all is available everywhere, right? So people can discover what might seem like an old pop culture reference, but it's not really old because it's on the Internet somewhere. So I, I, yeah, as she, I just, I don't have to work at those. Those just, that's just the way my brain works. <laughs> and it, this is the first book I've written where I can really indulge in that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, it, it, it makes me laugh. So, I mean, I, I think I get most of them, 90% of them. Maybe there's a couple that I'm like, hmm, not sure what that one is, but I can't think of any of those. So maybe I get all of them. I don't know. <laughs> maybe my brain is just as pop culture as yours. <laughs> Um, You're my ideal reader, then. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, did you do any kinds of research for this book? Um, actually, not much for this one. Um, here and there, there's little things that pop up, like there's a reference to Bishop Usher's The History of the World that set the date for the creation of the world on a very, I think it was a Wednesday in October in 4004 BC. He pinned it down to like the, the exact time. Exactly. And, you know, I yeah. had to, I looked that up. I was aware of the book and that date, but I needed to get a little more detail. So, so stuff like that occasionally will pop up. But as far as the vampires and werewolves, I felt no need whatsoever to do any uh, research on those because the whole setup of these worlds is that the shapers can make things however they want so i do play with the fact that you know um i think there's some reference to you know do they cast you know can you see their reflection and things like that and i'll play with some of those ideas a bit but if something doesn't match up what shauna thinks a vampire werewolf how they should work um doesn't matter because that's just the way that the shaper of this world decided to make them work so this one didn't take much research um Master of the World I did a bit more because it was so much based on Jules Verne. And while I'd read sort of the big ones, you know, uh, uh, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea and Mysterious Island and so forth, I certainly hadn't read all of Verne. And so I did I did some digging into some of his books and his descriptions of airships and things like that, and in his character names, because every every secondary, almost every secondary character in our minor character in Master of the World is actually from a Jules Verne book. Uh, it has nothing to do with their character in the book. I just took their name and gave it to a character in in that world. So I had I had fun with that sort of thing. Um, but yeah, this was not a particularly research heavy one. <laughs> Time for our second break of the podcast. So stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review podcast, and I will be right back. Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. Hey! The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch. Whatever it may be, visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play.
Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast. Just as a reminder, before the break, I asked about research. So Edward was talking about the different types of research he might do for each book. But of course, each book, as I said at the beginning, is it takes place on a world that has been shaped. And so the laws of what we might understand for the references uh, might not be the same in each world. So let's go ahead and get back to the interview with Edward. Yeah, and that's that's nice because if if you, you because you can play with it, like like you said, the the last world was Jules Verne. This world is vampires and werewolves, but each world is based on something from that the shaper wants it to be based on. But they also have the ability to then you know change the lore or um, alter things so that they. I don't know if they make more sense, maybe to the shaper, maybe not, but um, to how they, or they just to make the world, world work. Yeah. I mean, cause yeah. in this, in the, this case, the vampires and the werewolves and the peasants are all supposed to be living happily ever after uh, through something called the pact, um, which is my other favorite joke because the pact was, uh, was set up by Abbot Nathan Costello as this werewolf and vampire <laughs> troop was there. And, yeah. Yeah, so that's Abbott. Abbott and Costello meets the werewolves and the vampires. So that's my favorite joke in this book. Um, but um, that you know that was just something that doesn't come from anywhere except for the the needs of the both my story, but also the needs of the world that the this, that was created here. Because the original idea of the creators of this world was it was going to be a uh, you know, just a nice place where vampires and werewolves and peasants all hung out together. <laughs> and then something has gone wrong, as we discover uh, through the course of the book. Did you write this book just so you could use that joke? <laughs> no, that joke did not even occur to me until I was writing the scene. I was writing about the backstory, and I suddenly realized, wait, it's a church. There could be an abbot. This is a werewolf. This is a vampire. Oh, I know the abbot's name. <laughs> it was literally on the moment I got to that point in the writing that it came to me. <laughs> That's fabulous. Um, what can you tell us about book four? Where are we going next? Well, um, book four is a bit up in the air. I don't know for sure if it will come out from DAW, but I do hope to write it, so it might be coming out from my own publishing company. Um, book four is set up at the end of this book. It doesn't have a title yet, um, but it will be in a film noir kind of world, and it's all plotted out. I know what happens in it, so you know if I just sit down and start writing it, <laughs> I can make it happen. Um, so it's, it's kind of a film noir world. There's... Um, I think Humphrey Bogart and the Maltese Falcon and maybe some Jimmy Cagney thrown in there. And it might, I haven't decided yet, but it might literally be a black and white world where everything in the world is uh, seen in black and white. I, I'm playing with that. I think that could be fun. It'd be an interesting writing challenge not to use any color words to describe things. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's so many possibilities for uh, not only with the black and white, but also just with film noir and, you know, again, lots more pop culture references. Um, I, I do want to finish the the series, whether Daw continues it or not, because I do know how it ends, and I think, you know, it's it's open ended, so it could, you know, conceivably go on for book after book after book. But at the same time, I do know what the end is, and I could conceivably wrap it up in about three more books. Uh, so whatever happens with uh, Daw uh, on publishing it, um, I'm I will. I hope I will <laughs> actually finish the series. Well, that that's good because I was actually just thinking about that this morning. I was thinking, you know, this book really could go on indefinitely because there are, you know, that just that many worlds that they could go through. But the, I was very much hoping that it would not go on for the next, oh, I don't know, 30 years. <laughs> so I'd, I'd like no, some if, closure at some point, please. Yeah, if, <laughs> don't, if it don't ends up Stephen coming... King. <laughs> if it ends up uh, and I'm publishing it or I'm finding a, a different publisher, I, either way, I suspect uh, I will wrap it up, partly because, you know, things have changed dramatically enough in what Shauna can do and so forth in this book that I'm actually getting very close to the point where I can just push it through to to the end game with the Greer and the adversary and everything. So I would think... We need at least three more books, but I'm not pinning myself down. <laughs> All right. Sounds good. So in addition to 
writing this series and writing uh, other books as well. Um, you also have a podcast. Do you want to talk about that podcast a little bit? Yes, that's the, the World Shapers podcast. Uh, it, that's the theworldshapers.com. Um, oddly enough, it has the same title, uh, almost the same name as my series, because they started at exactly the same time. Uh, I'm a journalist by training. I was a newspaper reporter for years, and I've hosted TV and radio programs. And I always thought, you know, I could I could do a fine podcast once podcast started. It took me years to get around to actually doing it, and this was kind of the impetus, this tie-in with the launch of the series. And I've always loved at conventions and places like that, talking to other authors about the the nuts and bolts of writing, the creative process. So I decided, um, well, what if I did that? And I do have connections in the field now. You know, I've been, you know, I've met a lot of people, and so I reached out to some big name authors to start with: uh, John Scalzi and Robert J. Sawyer, Tanya Huff, and Julie Sharnada were my first four authors. And the podcast is up to episodes as of this week, in fact. I'm doing one today. It will be 65, 66, I think. Um, I talk to authors for an hour about um, their creative process. We talk about uh, usually focusing on a particular book as an example. Talk about how they got started writing and, and interested in writing and all of that. And then we go through the process from idea creation to um, planning, outlining, writing process, revision, editing. And then at the end, I'll ask the big philosophical questions. I always do that with my voice. I'm going to put reverb on it one of these days. The big philosophical questions, um, which are, why do you write? Which is always interesting to hear what people have to say. Or why do you think anybody writes? Um, and it's been going very well. I've had amazing guests, you know, David Brin, Tad Williams, David Weber, Joe Haldeman, Seanan McGuire, I've just talked to Cory Doctorow, uh, James Morrow. Um, I've got O. F. Paul Wilson. Or recent interviews that haven't even aired yet, but I've done. Um, so yeah, people have been very generous with their time, and I've been I've been thrilled to have an opportunity to to talk to all these wonderful people. And it has actually um, created out of out of those guests, you have actually now created um, uh, Shapers of Worlds which is a collection of short stories from authors who have been guests on that podcast. So do you want to talk a little bit about Shapers of Worlds? Yeah, that was because of the Shadow Paw Press, which we talked about. Um, I'm a member of Sask Books, which is the Association of Saskatchewan Publishers. And at our annual meeting last year, uh, there was a publisher from Winnipeg came in and did a presentation on kickstarting, and she'd successfully kickstarted an anthology. And I was listening to that, and I thought, Hey, I know some authors. <laughs> so uh, it took me a while again to, you know, because I'd never done a Kickstarter and that was a little daunting. And, you know, I'm busy with other stuff too. Um, but I finally, I reached out to my first year guests. I had to cut it off somewhere and ask them if how many would be interested in either writing original fiction or, a, um, re or offering a reprint. And I ended up with um, uh, brand new stories from uh, Seanan McGuire, Tanya Huff, David Weber, L.D. Modisett Jr., D.J. Butler, Christopher Rocchio, John C. Wright, Shelley Adina, and some guy named Edward Willett. Because I was actually a guest on my own podcast. I interviewed myself uh, as with one of my pseudonyms, interviewed me. <laughs> and then uh, there was reprints from John Scalzi, David Brin, Joe Haldeman, Julie Easterneda, Fonda Lee, Dr. Charles E. Gannon, Gareth L. Powell, Derek Kunskin, and Thorea Dyer. And the Kickstarter went off in March. Hmm, great timing. Uh, but it worked, and it funded, and uh, it just went out. The print copies went out to backers about a month ago. The ebook copies are out, and various other rewards. And it's now available as an ebook everywhere Amazon, Barnes and Noble, wherever it is you like to buy ebooks, it's available, as well as through shadowpawpress.com. You can download it directly from there, which is great if, if you'd like to do that, because I make more money that way. <laughs> and uh, the print version, the commercial print version is in the works. It's being printed, and I have a distributor for that, and I believe it goes out officially November 17th is the release date. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm very excited about it, and I'm very pleased. It's an interesting mixture, because a lot of anthologies have a, a theme, and the only theme here is Here's a showcase of some authors. So there's science fiction, there's fantasy, there's creepy little stories, there's fun stories, there's uh, all kinds of different stories. So you'll find, um, you should find, everyone should find something for them <laughs> within this anthology. 
That is very cool. Do you think you would uh, do something like this again? I've already reached out to my second-year guests, and a lot of them are okay. coming. Oh, sure. So we've got people like Barbara Hambly and Kelly Armstrong, Tim Pratt, uh, S.M. Sterling, people of that level um, who have already said, sure, either they might be able to offer original story or a reprint. Uh, so I suspect there's another Kickstarter in my in my future along about <laughs> February or March. <laughs> well, I and hope next Shapers year. Shapers of Worlds, Volume 2. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Hopefully next year will not be another 2020, but hopefully the yeah, process that would be will nice. go as well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so you are clearly plenty busy with everything. Are you working on anything specific now? I know you said you have book four in your head, but are you working on writing anything else? Well, my next contract with DAW is actually for a completely different project. It'll be a big sprawling space opera called The Tangled Stars. Um, so that's sold, and uh, it's due in March, so I should probably be getting on that <laughs> right about now. <laughs> yeah. And it's going to be about 150,000 words, so it's, it'll be my longest. Well, uh, I wrote that much for Mage Bane, uh, which I wrote under one of my pseudonyms, Lee Arthur Chain. It was about 150,000 words, so this will be my one of my longest uh, books. So I'm very excited about that. I, I love writing. Like, these are kind of the... the, the World Shapers books have a science fiction backstory. All of this stuff goes back to aliens, but it reads like a portal fantasy. So they're usually called fantasies. Um, but it'll be fun to do just a proper flat-out spaceships and wormholes and things uh, kind of a science fiction epic. I'm looking forward to that. Sounds very fun. Um what have you in all of your spare time? It sounds like you have so much. Um, but what do you what have you been reading since we talked last? Uh, I tend to read parts of the books of the people that I'm interviewing on the podcast. <laughs> I don't always get them read completely, uh, so I hear you. that's a, that takes up a lot of my time. But uh, I, like I'm currently reading, I've already interviewed James Morrow, but I uh, am currently reading his book, The Last Witchfinder, um, and you know, so I read. Ones I've read to completion, that's one I'm reading to completion. Uh, there's a book by Edward Savio called Alexander X, a YA book, which I read recently. Um, read a lot of nonfiction. My wife and I have, our kitchen does not lend itself to both of us cooking side by side at the same time. So we've gotten into the habit of, while she cooks, I read out loud. Uh, so we've read things like um, Matt Ridley's book about innovation we read recently. We read all of Hamilton, the huge, massive <laughs> biography that the musical came out of we read all that out loud um so yeah it's a, it's just an eclectic mixture of stuff oh well, i guess the one thing i have made sure i get is the latest jim butcher uh dresden files books so <laughs> i never miss one of those mm-hmm. or, a, or a david weber book I, I i never miss those thank you Okay, so you've mentioned the website for the podcast. How about your um, your author website and where people can connect with you on social media? My author website is uh, edwardwillett.com. Make sure there are two T's on Willett, W-I-L-L-E-T-T. Um, there's also my publishing thing, which I mentioned, shadowpawpress.com. People who would like to buy autographed books from me, uh, you can buy those and also download some ebooks um, from edwardwillettshop.com. That's my online store. So those are my three major websites. Uh, if you want to look at my one of my uh, <laughs> pseudonyms, there's also ecblake.com has his own website. And my YA, YA series Shards of Excalibur, which I just put out in new ebooks uh, from uh, Shadowpaw Press, has its own website, shardsofexcalibur.com. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so sometimes if you go to one of my websites and it seems a little behind, it's probably because I forgot I had it because I've got so many websites. Uh, my uh, my social media is uh, on Twitter. I'm at E. Willett, and The World Shapers is at The World Shapers, and Shadowpaw Press is at Shadowpaw Press. Um, on Facebook, I'm at Edward Willett, and you can also find uh, The World Shapers on there at The World Shapers and Shadowpaw Press at Shadowpaw Press. And about else, I, I am on Instagram, but I'm not very good at it. But you can find me at Edward Willett Author on Instagram. Thank you so much for that. We have talked about 
a variety of things today, but is there anything that we haven't covered that you were um, wanting to mention in terms of the the series or your other books or the podcast, anything at all that we haven't covered? Well, I do just want to mention the, the Shards of Excalibur that I just mentioned in passing. Um, this is a series, five book series, YA. Uh, it's about a girl from here, right here in Regina, who discovers she has the power of the Lady of the Lake. Um, Lady of the Lake shows up in Wascana Lake, which is about three blocks from my house. Because <laughs> why not? Everybody's got to be somewhere. And it tells her that she has the power of the Lady of the Lake and that she and this boy have to find the scattered shards of Excalibur before Merlin can. He's the bad guy in, in the series. Uh, in his modern day guise as Rex Majors, like a Bill Gates, Steve Jobs kind of computer magnet guy. And so that's the premise. And it was published by a local com a company called Kato Books, very respected literary publisher, who went out of business, went bankrupt this year. And uh, so I got the rights back, and I've now put out all the books out again in ebook through Shadowpaw Press. You can find them on everywhere you can buy ebooks. The first one is Song of the Sword, and uh, I think they're a good series. Song of the Sword was uh, long listed for the Sunburst Award for Canadian speculative fiction writing, one of the major Canadian awards. And uh, the second book, Doran uh, Twist of the Blade, was. Uh, shortlisted for the Aurora Award for Best YA Novel. And the last book in the series, Door into Fairy, was also shortlisted for Best YA Novel for an Aurora. So I think they're a good series. And I would just, oh, there's also great audiobooks narrated by Elizabeth Clapp. So I would really like people to, to find those. So that's the other thing I would like to mention. And I just, I guess I just did. <laughs> Yes, you did. Uh, speaking of audiobooks, one one more. Um, will there be an audiobook of The Moonlit World, and do you have an idea on when that might be out? I don't know. They was not picked up by the company that did the first two books, which each of which had a different narrator, which was interesting as well. Um, so at the moment, there are no plans for an audiobook for The Moonlit World. Uh, but uh, again, um, it's possible that I might so that something could happen there. I just don't know. There are some things happening with the. Uh, I'm, I'm working on a package with the Moonlit World. Like uh, I'm hoping to do a series Bible and all that sort of stuff, and see about pitching it to some movie types, TV types. I have no idea. Of course, mostly nothing ever happens with that kind of stuff. But uh, so, and an audio book might fall in there somewhere. I don't know. But at the moment, there's no plans. I could Thank do it you. myself if I got the rights back, but I don't think I'm the right voice for it. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe for Carl. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, um, Edward, I want to thank you so much for taking the time out of your day. I know you have your own podcast to record later, so um, thank you so much for joining me and talking about the the podcast and the series and the new book, The Moonlit World. Well, thanks so much for having me on again. I enjoyed it, and maybe I'll talk to you again in another year or so. <laughs> I hope so. That would be wonderful. Once again, thank you to Edward for joining me for the second time on this podcast to talk about the Moonlit World. I enjoy this series, and I enjoy, I mean, I'm, I'm excited to see where it goes and what worlds are coming up. My dad also read the, I just, he just read all three of them in the last um, month or so, and so we've been we've been talking about them, and he he called me the other day and, and asked the question that I um, asked Edward of, so if there are infinite numbers of worlds, how long is this series going to last? And so I said, ah, I asked Edward that exact question. You'll have to listen to the interview. So I got to pass this link on to my dad so he can hear Edward's answer on that question. Thank you, Edward, for joining me. Thank you, listeners, as always, for being the wonderful book lovers that you are. I hope you will join me again for the next episode when I have another returning author. Jim Nelson has been on the podcast before talking about his Bridge Daughter series. This time he will be talking a little bit more about that series as well as his new cyber noir thriller. It's called In My Memory Locked. It's a little bit futuristic, not too far in the future, and um, it's intrigue and well, obviously, it's a thriller, cyber noir. I mean, that tells you a lot, right? You know, there's going to be some intrigue, some mystery, some futuristic stuff, and um, some intensity because it's a thriller. So join me for that again. That's Jim Nelson. His book is called In My Memory Locked. I hope you're having a wonderful week. I hope that if you are behind, you're getting caught up <laughs> like I am or that you just never got behind in the first place. That would be better. 
But thank you so much for joining me and join me again next time. But in the meantime, I hope you have plenty of time to get yourself lost in a good book. Thanks. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast, part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network from Movie to music from sports to entertainment and even weird news you can also follow us on twitter and on facebook thank you and we hope you have enjoyed today's program